from a clinical point of view, obviously, if you go to your your interview days, you do a lot of research around what you think you're going to be asked on that day. And I think my thoughts going into that interview process was why the company and why the role are the two sort of main factors to cover off. So yeah, it did quite a lot of reading around where the company was at, what their what I thought their focuses were based on external sort of news and reports. And um, there was quite a lot of videos of the founder speaking and speaking about the mission as well. So I think that sort of prep work is is really important. What is it like as a doctor when you're moving from a clinical to a non-clinical role in health tech? How do you move into health tech and what is that application process like? And is the grass really greener? Listen to this episode with Dr. James Wadkin who moved from clinical medicine, working as a teaching fellow, to becoming the clinical partnerships director at a global health tech company, MedShare. So he gives us some really juicy insider tips on how he prepared for his interview and how he got the job, but also how he got promoted very quickly. And before we get into that episode, do not forget to subscribe. And if you want to know when the next episode is out and be the first to watch it feel free to go to medicfootprints.org forward slash join our mission and you will be the first to be notified let's face it burnout amongst doctors is sky high and we're actively seeking other ways to make the most of our transferable skills beyond the usual career pathways Welcome to Disrupting Doctors' Careers. I'm your host, Dr. Abena Babas-Jones, and I'm on a mission to connect one million doctors across the world with the best in diverse career opportunities. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Disrupting Doctors' Careers podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Abena Babas-Jones, the founder of Medic Footprints and a career change expeditious expert. (laughs) I'm trying to think, what am I going to say about that? Anyway, today we have Dr. James Wadkin, who is a clinical partnerships director at the amazing global platform called MedShare. And I'll tell us a little bit more about that. And what we're going to be focusing on today is um, James's journey from doctor clinician, like many of us, that's how he started out, to a non-clinical role in health tech. So health tech, massive sector, as I always like to say, health tech is essentially health. And um, a lot of doctors are looking to get into health in in health or health tech in in numerous ways and also in a non-clinical capacity where you do not have to see patients so how do you actually uncover and bag those roles and grow and progress into those roles so as I mentioned James is a clinical director how did he manage to progress into that leadership role so we're going to cover all of that today and really understand more about what it took to kind of navigate through some of the interview process involved in that. But anyway, welcome, James. Thank you so much for your time today. No problem at all. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. So let's get started with why why health tech, why alternative careers? Why did you start looking for other options? So for, for me, I think it's probably a, it's a different personal journey for everyone who um, sort of looks to um, seek different alternatives outside of sort of the classical medicine pathway. I think for me, it started, so I completed my foundation training and then took a role as a clinical teaching fellow at Imperial College in London. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the time I took that um, teaching role was sort of going into the third wave of the, the COVID pandemic. Um, so at that time, we were sort of teaching medical students, but there was a, quite a lot of working from home, having Zoom calls. Um, it was very much a Monday to Friday. Um, it definitely wasn't shift pattern based. Um, and I was doing a lot less clinical work at that time. And I think that's when I really started to sort of explore what other opportunities there are out there. And I think that that sort of year as a teaching fellow really allowed me the space and the time and the awareness that there are routes outside of the the classical training pathways that quite a lot of doctors um, choose to to pursue. 
Um, and that's when I started my exploration, really, and, and started to look at what alternative paths um, doctors can take outside of the NHS. Awesome. So uh, like many doctors, actually, I've spoken to recently, the pandemic kind of triggered something, triggered an opportunity that led to an opportunity that actually led to a journey uh, to something else. So, I mean, that's really fascinating. And uh, I mean, had you before this period, had you ever thought about other options? Yeah, I think when I was doing my foundation training, I was very much um, focused on surgery originally. My portfolio was very much based around surgery and I, I wanted to pursue that career path. And then I had a rotation in general surgery and actually thought that the day to day life and what I wanted of, of my own life and, and how I wanted to um, see myself in five, 10 years from now probably wasn't aligned with what I was seeing from the seniors that I was working with on a day to day, -day basis. So I think that was the point where I thought, because originally I was thinking I'm going to finish my foundation training, go straight into specialty training, core surgical, go on from there. And I think that was the really sort of the starting point of me thinking, let's try and explore other options and, and see what else is out there. And I think for me, I had quite a, a long exploratory phase where I was doing a lot of reading around on the Internet and sites like Medic Footprints and communities on, on Facebook of clinicians who are exploring alternative careers and just speaking to people as well. So reaching out to people who, who had um who had were clinicians by background or even some of the some of my friends who had partners or close friends who were working in other sectors and really having a conversation with them to see what was their day-to-day -day like could I do that was it going to be interesting to me um and essentially trying to work out is the grass greener <laughs> um I think there's a there's a, a mentality sometimes that working in the NHS is is terrible and the grass is greener and I think there are pros and cons um, to working in, in alternative careers but I don't think it's necessarily a, um, a right route for everyone yeah I mean I'd, I'd love to explore that together with you because obviously both of us have had that experience of alternative careers and that journey and we've both got different perspectives on it yeah let's break that down <laughs> mm. a little bit in the sense that like grass being greener um, I reflect on is the grass greener and actually, I would say yes. I was just thinking, like, would I? Yeah, it is. It is definitely greener. But the grass can also be very many different colours depending yeah. on the season. <laughs> it yeah. can be dry. It can be really dry. It can be yellow. It can be blue. Yeah. But um, yeah, there are pros and cons. But it completely depends on what you're actually doing, right? And and yeah. what your life looks like. So, so, I mean, reflecting for you at this point, how would you compare the two? The kind of like the package yeah for you. I think for me that the grass is definitely greener and um, but I think <laughs> it is an individual um situation I, I get quite a lot of doctors or people that I've gone through medical school with who reach out to me and say oh I can see you're working in health tech now can we have a conversation I'm um thinking about possible alternative careers and I, I always say that I think it's an individual circumstance and an individual decision because there are pros and cons and I think there are differences and some real core differences and there are some things that you can't get away from so I think in terms of working in medicine and especially the, the reasons that people go into medicine in the first place um quite often are tied to um their personality their sense of worth the reward they get from helping patients on a day-to-day -day basis and that that patient interaction and if they work in hospital medicine the big team they have around them and the the team working ethic where quite often my experience of hospital medicine is that the team really works together there's usually a really good spirit um and that there are some real positives of that from working in the nhs i guess in terms of the positives of being on the outside i think that probably once again depends on what role you're going into and and the specifics of that i think from my personal point of view i've really enjoyed coming into more of a, a startup health tech type business and having quite a lot of autonomy. So it's something that I didn't really have in the NHS. You're in a big system, you have um, very restrictive roles. Um, and now in, in the current role that I'm in, I have a lot more autonomy to um, A, be creative and B, to manage my own workload, manage my own time, uh, manage my own deadlines, um, and also then look to progress in a leadership and management role as well um rather than from an nhs point of view working your way up the ladder in a in a very think, set manner yeah and no, i think i think you've raised some really interesting points there and in the fact that you you have a 
a lot more autonomy than you did in NHS clinical practice. And when, when, when people talk about autonomy, it's like, well, actually, that's a really great thing to have, right? You know, you get to just design everything yourself and make decisions yourself. But what I, I found, I don't know whether you had the same experience, especially at the beginning where suddenly I had all this autonomy to decide how long I was going to work. Uh, when I'd stopped working, that was that was a big issue, like actually stopping working. Like there were no real boundaries for a while for me. Um, how much I would pay myself. I mean, obviously you're in jobs. So with that, you had to, to have negotiated a salary compared to yep. in the NHS where you're yep. told what you'll get. And <laughs> yep. that's it. There's no negotiation there. This is what you're worth. And this is what we're going to value you as. Yep. Um, and then you mentioned talking about deadlines and goals and all of that stuff where, again, like that's not something that as doctors we're used to really doing for ourselves besides like having to get stuff sorted out for our portfolio. Right. So yeah. like how, how did you manage that transition where you've got all this kind of newfound autonomy and freedom in that sense? Cause actually I found it quite overwhelming mm-hmm. and I made so many mistakes along the way yeah. that kind of went, cause I started off going, Oh, I've got all this free everything. Um, but actually kind of making decisions about actually boundaries in my life was really challenging at the, at, at the start. But I'd love to hear from your perspective as to how you found that. Yeah, definitely. I, I'd say firstly, it's not a um, day one. Suddenly you're used to um, you can set your own goals. You can set your own <laughs> boundaries and suddenly you're, you're good mm-hmm. to go. It's very much a transitional phase. And I, I, I think from my personal point of view, I'm still transitioning, still learning, mm. still setting my own boundaries and, and my own goals. Um, but I think also a really key part of it, part of, of my personal journey was when I when I joined MedShare, there was a, a senior uh, clinical med- um, chief medical officer um, who had a really similar background to me. So she'd come through clinical medicine, progressed into and segued over into health tech and then progressed up sort of the leadership ladder here as well. And for me, it was really useful to essentially have that mentoring to actually sort of someone who's been in your shoes before, they know where you've come from, they understand what clinical life was like and the skills that you gain in clinical medicine. Uh How do you transfer those into a non-clinical environment? And how do you actually then build upon them to, yeah, start setting goals, understand sort of the long-term benefits, put strategy in place around Uh um, some of your sort of um, measurable goals as well. Um, so for me, I think that was a key part of it, having that sort of mentoring and that sort of role modeling to see how to make that transition. But I think it's um, in medicine, there's a lot of talk around sort of lifelong learning. And I think that's true mm-hmm. when you're in medicine and your your lifelong learning is around the management of diabetes and how that evolves over time mm-hmm. or in, in roles outside of um, clinical medicine. I think it's still as important to keep learning, keep adapting and um, and keep transitioning, really. Awesome. Awesome. Um, it's, I mean, it's great to hear that you had a mentor when you moved into the company, but let's actually talk about the actual move into the company before I ask more about the mentorship that you received. So um, how did you actually get into MedShare? How did that, what was that journey like? So um, when I was doing my um, clinical teaching fellow role, I reached out to um, several people, some of which I knew, some of which were friends of friends, um, mostly were medics who had moved into alternative careers. So I spoke to um, someone who was in medical affairs and pharmaceutical um, company, someone was in management consulting, and then I spoke to someone who was in um, a different health tech company. And part of that exploratory phase was then thinking, oh, I need to set up a LinkedIn profile here, which I think quite a lot of doctors in the UK still um, don't necessarily have a LinkedIn profile. Um, so I set up a LinkedIn and started looking at the jobs on LinkedIn. And I, I use that as sort of um, a phase of what can I actually do here with the skills that I have in medicine, what's available across these different alternative careers. And whilst I was searching for jobs in health tech, I came across um, the MedShare job advert. Um, and at that point, it was for um, a clinical manager and advisor. So that's the sort of the entry level um, here for clinicians that are making the move across into health tech. Um, thought it looked interesting, applied, went through the application process, um, and then started the job after my teaching fellow year. Okay, let's 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 backtrack. So <laughs> I, I love it when people are like, "Yeah, I saw the job, I applied, and then I started the job, and there was no <laughs> challenges in that whatsoever." <laughs> 
rolled into the company. So yeah. I'd love to, <laughs> I'd love to hear a little bit more about that bit of the journey. Yeah. Um, so tell me more about because I mean a lot of doctors. I think one of the biggest challenges for them is identifying a job that they want to actually apply for and that they think they can do but more yep. specifically the actual applying right yep. so the is my cv good enough like how do i stand out so what kind of things did you do to stand out in your application do you um, think looking back i think i think a key one um and something that i now see when we're, we're hiring new doctors now is um around how you frame your experience and frame why you want to move from a clinical role into say a health tech role and i think quite a lot of time doctors frame it around the negatives of their current role or the negatives of working in the nhs and i think a really key aspect is framing it around the positives why do you want to work for this company why do you want to move into this sector what is it that interests you and what is it that you can bring to that company in that sector so i think part of it is that i think around the the actual process itself Firstly, I had to go to my CV because my CV was a medical CV, which is sort of nine, 10 pages long and lists every um, sort of poster presentation that I did in medical school and audits and all the rest. And really just slim that down to just sort of a what I'd call sort of a normal CV where it's two sides at most. Um, so that was sort of step number one. Um, and then applying for roles. I think from my point of view, I have an attitude of, um, I was applying for quite a few different roles with the attitude of if they turn me down, there's no interview, then I'm in the same position as I was before I applied to those roles. So I sent my application sort of covering letter and CV to quite a few different jobs that are available on LinkedIn. And then in terms of MedShare, they then um, offered me sort of a first round interview um, and then progressed to a second round interview with their senior team. Um, and the interview process then is much more around, and that probably differs from, from company mm. to company, but the interview process is much more sort of who you are, what's your background, what are your skills? And once again, what can you, what, what interests in you in this sure. role? And this I'm just going to backtrack one more time. I really should oh, sorry, I'm earlier. jumping ahead too much. No, no, that's <laughs> fine. Because again, like it's really important for us to walk through this process because a lot of doctors are going through exactly the same process. And and strategy. So one of the things that medical equipment we do in supporting doctors is advising them on how to go about getting or uncovering opportunities, whether it's, I've talked about this a lot, the front door, the side door, the back door. So okay. we're in this conversation we're talking about the front door route is the apl application route. Mm -hmm. um, but tell us a bit more about you know, we've talked, we're talking about MedShare, but also we're talking about you actually applied for a number of jobs and you've just said that, mm -hmm. you know, having having a CV and and a cover letter and if you, you won't lose anything if you're kind of sending in your cv to multiple ones however our philosophy is obviously you have lost the time that you've invested in finding these jobs and applying for them because i know i've seen lots of doctors or people in general that can apply for hundreds mm -hmm. and actually making it more of a kind of statistical uh yeah. result rather than actually kind of i'm just going to really like laser laser line focus on like a number of particular employers that I really want to invest and work in so that when I do yeah. apply that I will hands down minimum get an interview so I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on that actual process that you chose to go down yeah I, and I think on reflection my process probably wasn't the the best one to 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 advise mm. for everyone else to follow I think it was somewhere in between the sending out hundreds and hoping for the best based on sort of the numbers and probabilities and the the laser targeting approach. So it's somewhere mm -hmm. in the middle. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that the problem with sending it out to everyone as well is that, yes, it is the time factor, but also what I was doing was per application for the cover letter and the CV, I was tailoring it. change it every time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and that takes time in itself, right? Yeah. So I think that's why I found that middle ground in between because mm -hmm. I wasn't, I don't think I, at that point could have been laser targeted because I didn't really know what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I was open to a few new experiences, a few new different roles. And also, I don't think you fully know what the role encompasses until you're actually in the role. Um, yeah obviously even, even here's a secret even the companies don't really yeah. know what it is <laughs> actually about until you're in the role that's yeah. like the biggest secret I'm uncovering now guys people most companies don't really know what they're looking for 
<laughs> yeah, we managed exactly. to get a job description down but it is it's like a kind of this is what we think we know no and then it also depends on the people that are coming in because they help shape that role right but we'll yep. get to that so we're talking about the interview so yep. tell me a bit more about the interview process like how many stages what um, are they looking for so our personal interview process has changed since then so we've now got sort of a three-stage process the first of which is we have um our what did head- you go through at the time I had a two stage process. We were a much mm-hmm. smaller company at the time. Um, so I had a first um, intro call with the chief medical officer, just very much a 30 minute chat. Who are you? What's your background? Why are you interested? And um, sort of a bit of a screening type chat. Um, and then a second stage was that sort of the final interview with a senior leadership team and the CEO of the company. Um, which is more around a bit more of a structured interview, sort of um, why MedShare, why the role, sort of situation based questions um, and a bit more about sort of digging into am I going to be a good fit for for the company in the role. So that was sort of the process at that point. And how much research did you do about the company before you went into the interview? Uh, quite a lot. I think I think mm-hmm. that's quite important. I think it's um, from a clinical point of view, obviously, if you go to your your interview days, you do a lot of research around what you think you're going to be asked on that day. And I think my thoughts going into that interview process was why the company and why the role are the two sort of main factors to cover off. So yeah, it did quite a lot of reading around where the company was at, what their, what I thought their focuses were based on external sort of news and reports. And um, there was quite a lot of videos of the founder speaking and speaking about the mission as well. Mm. So I think that sort of prep work is is really important. Mm. And how did that actually translate to the interview itself? Like how how was that prep work important? How did that manifest for you? It just meant that when when the questions of why MedShare and why this role came up, mm-hmm, I could mm-hmm. one on one hand reflect that I'd done my research, I knew what the company was doing, and I knew why um, I wanted to work in this company and work at this role. But I could also weave in what's my experience, what are my skills and what can I bring to that role and bring to the company to help them on their mission to to make this role really useful for them um, for the company. Mm-hmm. Well. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of both aspects of that. Right. And how was that received? Obviously very good. Hope, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so I, I, um, I got offered the job um, the day after I did my final interview. Um, ah, so it was quick. a very quick interview process yeah 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 so I mean uh, it's very common to be either offered the job like next day or the day or in the yeah. interview <laughs> I've seen multiple times and so I mean clearly you know the prep work and um, your performance at that time uh, paid off and you know you are where you are now and you're progressed but I'd love to kind of really delve a little bit deeper about some of the again, other challenges that doctors face when they're going for interviews, um, just to highlight that it is a two way process. Oh, yeah. So part of your research was also about do- doing your own due diligence on the company yeah. and making sure that it was a good fit for you. Right. As yeah. well as confirming that or having that validated in the interview. And so, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's, it's really key. Yeah. Uh, um, I think there's a a lot of aspects that are semi taken for granted in the NHS because it's just one employer across the whole country. So if you want to be a surgeon, you have to go and apply for a surgical training post on the NHS. You don't really get to choose your employer, but it's definitely Mm. a two way process. And it's something that now if I'm interviewing on behalf of MedShare, I'm acutely aware of because the employer who you're interviewing with want the best candidates. So it is very much a you need to impress what your skills are, how you'd fit into the company, how you're going to make that role your own. But you also need to get from it that, yes, I I think I can fit in this company. I like their mission, their team seem friendly um, and have that sort of two way, as you say, that two way interview process. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's really important, especially in a, in a small company like us, we're sort of a, we're growing quite quickly, but we're still quite a small um, head counts. And it's really important to have that sort of, that culture and build that culture and make sure that everyone's everyone gets on in the team there's a good sort of working dynamic and so it's really important that we select the right people to come into the team and also that people are coming into the team that want to come join make a difference as well Mm -hmm. 
I think there's some really important points made that made there and also kind of moving into your work with the company does that that same kind of relationship balance and culture continue in the sense that they are still trying to impress you as well as vice versa do you know what I mean I mean that, I, the way that I see it exactly like as a CEO is like you know you bring someone to the company but it's really important that they can see that you're authentic that you're really trying to go for that mission that you said you were going for yeah. and you want to make sure that you're providing an environment for them to thrive and be their best self yeah. in helping you to grow that company so yeah. do you feel that from the senior leadership yeah definitely it's a two-way relationship all the way through um mm -hmm. we've um we've recently sort of hired a new chief operating officer here is mm. really really started to put some structure and some um some structure around uh, the business and how things operate as well, which is fantastic to see. And, but it's definitely, yeah, you want the the senior leadership to nurture the talents and to, to make sure the culture and the environment is one that everyone wants to come to work every day and they want to be part of the team meetings and they want to do their best. But equally, yeah. from an, an individual employee point of view, you need to have the attitude of, I'm going to try my best. I'm going to do my best. I, no one expects you to be a finished product on day one, not even a finished product at all. But it's all about having that attitude of being open to new ideas, being open to conversations. And um, when you're asked to do tasks and do things by certain deadlines, being conscientious, communicating clearly, making sure that if you're not going to meet deadlines, then people are aware um, if you have any problems that you tell people, if you're finding things too easy and you want to push yourself a little bit further or or try different aspects of the role, different projects, then um, having that clear communication as well. So, yeah, that two way process definitely progresses past the interview stage and into. Yeah. the Yeah, interesting. And actually, I've got a question about the commercial mindset that's required to really thrive in these um, non clinical health tech roles so tell me a little bit more about again the contrast of being a clinician in the public sector and being a clinician in a non-clinical role with a commercial mindset like how was that transition yeah it's um it's an interesting one and I think I can only really speak from my own experience I know diff people have had different that's experiences. what we want <laughs> this is what we're, this is what you're here we only want you speaking for you FYI yeah. so I am um, <laughs> I think I've been I was been interested in that for a little while. So I've done mm. quite a lot of reading around it whilst I was applying for the role and then joining in MedShare and then um sort of progressing at more of the commercial aspects here. It it's definitely something that um a clinician coming straight from the NHS needs to build that awareness because it's just something you're not exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis in the NHS. Um you're looking after your patients, you you can do your audits and your research projects and um, your ward rounds and and be fantastic at all of that aspect um, but the commercial aspect is yeah it's a very different sort of scenario to be in and I guess it's difficult for me to sort of contextualize um, what what it is that you need to know I don't think there's anything in particular what you need to know I think it's just having the awareness that you need to get to grips with working in a private company that's trying to generate revenue and how do they get to that point and how are you leveraging your clinical knowledge to allow them to get to that point either through um, a direct mechanism or an indirect mechanism? And I think part of it is, um, at MedShare in, in particular, part of it is le leveraging your clinical knowledge to um, understand, and when we're talking to pharmaceutical companies, how their drug works, how then that affects pathophysiology, what their target audience might be, um, but also the aspects around how do doctors think how does uh, the usual care pathways work? If someone's dealing with a breast cancer, what's the MDT that's going to be around that um, that patient as well? And understanding how care pathways work through the NHS and how that might differ in um, different countries as well. So, that, so there's those different aspects, but I think it's it's quite hard for me to contextualise the sort of key commercial knowledge that you need to, to learn coming into a commercial role, really. Yeah, I mean, like, obviously it can vary. And I think some of the feedback that we've we've gotten from not only the doctor side but the clients that we work with or the companies that we work with as we work as a specialist doctor recruitment partner is that 
it's really important for doctors to have that like clinico commercial awareness that like mm. you are a business like you like bringing you as an individual or doctor into the business is actually an investment that they're expecting to get a return on the investment which they will get because you're a doctor right they will get that but it's it's about just realizing like, this is about business it's a business it's about money this is where you know there's there's no kind of smoke screen here businesses yeah. exist because they're there to make money and it's like how can you help us you know, achieve our mission, but also make money because yeah. without the money, we can't, we can't achieve our mission, yeah. you know, the greater goal. Um, yeah. And so it's like, you know, the way that you are thinking and any, any suggestions or recommendations or any activities that you do are all points to one direction, which is the money and the strategy and the, and the mission and the vision yeah. um, and the board or the senior team won't necessarily get behind it. If it won't eventually lead to money. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> It's like, yeah, putting yeah, it in a nutshell, this is what they're looking for. That, that is the fundamental <laughs> truth of it, yeah. And I think that's yeah. a fundamental um, change of mindset from, from working in clinical medicine. Um, mm -hmm. The fundamental mindset in clinical medicine is sort of you go and you help your patients and you try and make them better. And also it's quite, um, especially in the, when you're more junior, I think it probably changes if you um, get more senior, but it's a very sort of short-term mindset. So you mm -hmm. come in, you do your work, and then you go home, and then you come in, you see your patients, and you go home. And mm -hmm. there's very little long-term strategy, long-term goals, long-term mission objectives as well. Um, so that's, I guess, a, a bit of a shift in the fundamental mindset there as well. Yeah. And so the final point I really want to cover in this discussion is your promotion to clinical partnerships director. How long did that take from when you first joined the company to when um, you actually were promoted? It was a year, so it's quite quick. <laughs> so not, I mean, actually, I mean, I've seen quicker, I've seen months, <laughs> but not to say that you haven't done well, you've done remarkably well, but I'm just saying it's not uncommon yeah. for doctors to go into the private sector and soar, right? So just imagine, guys, whoever's listening, you are a junior doctor and then you're promoted to a consultant within like a few months. Like it's, kind of, it's kind of the equivalent, right? And you suddenly got all senior this... registrar, I should say. Senior registrar. Well, senior registrar, <laughs> but actually consultant. And, with the, and, and sometimes with the pay that goes with it as well. Like, you know, seven years in one year, right? So tell me more about what led to that and like why why you were promoted. That's an interesting question. I'll have to, I'll have to ask. <laughs> Did you not get um, the feedback in like any kind of a... Yeah, no, this is why yeah. we're giving this to you. It's like, no, James... <laughs> <laughs> you definitely, you definitely do. Um, I think there's several aspects. I think there's one of the fundamental reasons reasons why I want to leave the NHS. Actually, I was a bit um, disenfranchised with the way that you get on a training program and everyone plods up the ladder at the same rates, irrespective of whether you're the best anaesthetist or doctor or, or surgeon or you're the worst. Um, if you're on that ladder, you will plod your way up and you get your band of pay and there's no sort of um, added incentive really to go out there and do anything um, anything above and beyond so I think I came into the role with a mindset of I, I want to learn first and foremost and learn as much as I can um, but do so in a way where I'm trying to provide value so I think it comes back to your fundamentals of you've been employed that's an investment and um, how are you provide that return on investment and part of that for me was more of my interest in the commercial aspect of the business so I came in as a clinical manager. I was very much uh, more involved in sort of the medical strategy and the clinical aspects of the business, um, but then sort of shifted my focus more across to the commercial aspects and then had essentially direct revenue against me um, and direct return investment that I could then show. And um, it, it then became sort of a, a position where I How can- How did that work, James? What do you mean direct revenue against you? What did that look like exactly? It's hard to- explain it succinctly but um essentially um i'm now part of the team that generates deals that come in to to provide mm -hmm. revenue for the company mm -hmm. um, and you were able to do that in your previous role as well yeah so as, when you come in the clinical team here you sort of sit across all aspects because um the commercial team need clinical expertise and so do the sort of the community aspects as well um, but I think one of the benefits of being in a, in a startup type environment rather than a larger company is there's a lot more flexibility to go and explore different projects, be involved in different aspects. And, and what, how it works here is if you find something you're interested in that you're good at, you can then carry on down that path. Mm -hmm, so that's what mm -hmm. I did. Um, and then the sort of return investment and the value against you sort of increases. And that's um, how I essentially progressed and got promoted. 
Awesome. And con again, congratulations. It, it really is an amazing <laughs> achievement. And it's really great to see someone like yourself progress in a doctor led, doctor founded company. I'm always excited about those kind of companies. And so, one final question that I know we didn't cover and that a lot of doctors are also worried about. Again, going back to the big M word, money. Um, yep. So, when it came to like being given a job offer, um, how, again, how did you negotiate your salary and generally how does it compare to your salary as a junior doctor? So doctors kind of know what to expect in that whole process. Yeah. And um, once again, I can only really talk about my own experience, but, um, so I, when I took this role, I was very much an NHS doctor and I didn't even think to negotiate my starting salary. I didn't even think that was a possibility. Mm -hmm which sounds ridiculous, but I think that is the mindset you sort of get an offer in the NHS and you take that and you move on. Yeah. Um, so my starting salary when I came across was aligned with NHS pay bands. So yeah. I just finished as a sort of my teaching fellow role at sort of F3 sort of level. So they aligned it with sort of CT1, CT2 type level. And that was for the first six months, um, then past my probation period and then had a pay review and then things started escalating from there. Um, and then it becomes based on what what is the value you provide into the business? Do they want to reward you and keep you? And it, and it, in a founder led small business like this, it's directly related to what is the value you are, you are producing um, and how can we reward you for that? And your reward is directly linked to your pay packets, essentially, which is another mindset shift, I guess, from the NHS. So without talking specifics, current sort of and obviously now I'm on the more of the commercial aspect it's a bit it's a bit different but um earning substantially more than I would be doing in an NHS role mm -hmm. and then yeah how did that compare to then negotiating your leadership package yeah so that um it, it all rolls into one um so it, it was kind of like you're you're progressing you're getting promoted you take more leadership and more responsibility with that and then that's mm -hmm. reflected in the the salary and the compensation as well um mm -hmm. so it's not um it's not something for nothing it's definitely you have to you have to work for it and then you have the responsibility and accountability for that yeah um, whatever that might be so now I, I have a leadership position I've got management responsibilities I've got um responsibilities across the work I do and the goals I have to hit um, and yeah. And that that then is reflected in your compensation. Great. And do you have any insights into because when we look at remuneration packages, we're not just looking at the take home salary. We're also looking at other benefits yep. um, quite common in startup world and health tech startup are options and shares. Is yep. that something that has been talked about or considered or available to you? And like, was that seen as important to you? Yeah, it was an interesting one. It wasn't important to me when I joined, um, partly because, in all honesty, I didn't really know what what it was or what the value was of it. Um, but yes, we do have a share option scheme. Um, I got my share options at my six month probation. They vest over a four year period. Um, so I get vesting every year over the four year period um, and that can be reviewed. So um, I've got another review in March. Um, and then we can review sort of the conversation package there as well. So what I think the, the take home message is that things are flexible and you can negotiate things and you can um, leverage your position based on the value you're providing um, in the private sector. Whereas you, you can't do that in the NHS. You have bands and you are set to those bands, really. Brilliant. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. It's been really insightful. I've asked some very specific technical <laughs> questions and hopefully reflective questions, but only because like these questions that get asked every single day, the doctors that we uh, mentor and support, and we know these are the concerns and the questions that they have. But, you know, just just hearing your story and your journey is really inspiring I, I can promise you thousands and thousands of doctors not only in the UK but across the world so thank you so much for that insight and if anyone wants to get hold of you I know that like we have a lot of doctors that come on here and it's like I have like like hundreds of coffees with various doctors so I'm hoping <laughs> that this period of time um, and this podcast episode will help cut out some a lot of the questions and FAQs that you probably get but if they if we haven't covered anything that they've got <laughs> questions about, what's the best way to reach out to you? 
Um, I think probably LinkedIn. Feel free to add me on LinkedIn and, and drop me a message um, or I can send through my email after the podcast as well if that's useful. Brilliant. Thank you so much, James. Great. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Okay.